And uh, we're in the, I guess we're now in the third week of a brief sermon series I'm doing. And uh, the very first week, we talked about the on-demand God. Uh, a God who some people reject, and yet that isn't even who God is. That's not the real God. And then we talked in the second week about this killjoy God. And I related how that's God that I used to kind of have, or at least an image of God that I had. And how some people have this idea that God wants to have all these rules and regulations and laws so that we can't have fun. Right? Some people look at Christians and go, man, that's got to be boring. But it's not. Being a Christian is liberating. It's freeing. It's, it's a joy. And so we talked about that last, last week. And if you missed out on those, uh, they are available online for you to watch and you can get caught up there. But today, what I want to talk to you about is what I'm calling the goosebump God. Uh, you know, that I want to believe in God, but I'm not really feeling God in my life, right? I mean, how do you believe in a God that, that you can't see, you, you can't hear from audibly all the time, and you're really not feeling God, Right? I mean, I want to believe in you, God, but I, I don't feel you in my life. And I guarantee you, this is some of you now. Many of you have probably been here at some, pl- some point before, or maybe, maybe you'll feel this way somewhere down the road in the future. Uh, it depends on where you're at in your faith, but we experience this. This, this period where we're, we're like, I don't feel God, right? And if you've ever wondered where God is, and I want to talk about that today. Now, just for fun, a quick show of hands. If you're a follower of Jesus, how many of you would say that you've ever felt the presence of God? Yeah? A lot of you, right? A lot of us would say that we've felt the presence of God. I I certainly have. I certainly would fit into that category. Maybe you you felt it this morning, right? You got here and and you were talking to somebody and then their story spoke to you. You felt like God was present. Or maybe, you know, there was a song and Tanya hit that high note and it was like, Oh, God is here today, Right? It wasn't me hitting that high note, I'll tell you that. Um, so, so maybe it was a worship song. Maybe it was just on the drive here, right? There's certain music I can put on and kind of give myself that, 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 that feeling of the spirit, right? For me, it's Rich Mullins. I don't know if you know Rich Mullins, but Rich Mullins is the guy, if I put a Rich Mullins CD in, that tells you how old I am, I still use CDs. If I put a Rich Mullins CD in, uh, Rich speaks to me. That rich, rich is like one of my love languages, okay? And, and, and that, that speaks to me, and I feel it, and you get the tingly-wingly, you know, goosebumps feelings, right? And, and how do you know, how do you know that you really felt God, though? I mean, what do you say? What do you do? I mean, like I said, maybe, maybe you were moved, you know, maybe, maybe you had that peaceful, easy feeling, right? You, you just, you were kind of vibing with it, right? You had it going. That's an Eagles reference, if you don't know the Eagles. Um, I like the Eagles. But uh, how do you know? How do you know you actually felt the presence of God? Because I, I want to push in on that for a little while here. Because maybe you had like that tingly feeling, but maybe you had burritos last night, and that was what you were feeling. It wasn't the Holy Spirit. What, what, what triggered it, right? I mean, I can watch. I, 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 <laughs> you, you look at me. I, I'm a big old football player. I, you know, I got this deep voice, and I'm manly, manly. I like tools, and I ride a motorcycle, and... Yet, I can watch YouTube videos and bawl my eyes out, right? Emotional. Uh, I'm not quite Sarah McLaughlin in the dog video commercial. In the eyes of the angels. You know, she's ASPCA. Ah, I appreciate her work, but that's not the stuff that gets me going. But I'll watch a video. The show. Oh, I forget the name of it. Um, the, the show they used to do where they'd go in and remodel people's home. Tyler was the guy who led it. I just can't think of the name of it. What is it? Ty Pennington was his name. And he had this show, and he'd come into people's homes, and they'd just build a mansion out of, like, a, a, a literally about to collapse trailer home. And it would change their lives. And I'd watch that show and cry every week like a baby. Right? I'm that guy. I have that, that softness. And so, so, yeah, how do you know you felt God? Because, I mean, you, you can get that peaceful feeling if you just pour yourself a bubble bath, light some candles, and put on some Kenny G. You can kind of feel the same way, right? Especially when the water gets cold and you kind of get the goosebumps. <laughs> right? how, how do you know you're feeling the presence of God? How do you know? Uh, let me ask you this. If, if, if you didn't feel God today when you came to church, think about this. Whose fault is that? I mean, if you weren't feeling God already, whose fault is that? Is it God's fault? 
I mean, it was God like looking down on you going, well, I, I, I don't like your attitude this week. I'm not going to let you feel me. Maybe next week, right? Does God do that? Whose fault is it? Were your spiritual antenna not up when you came in and you missed it maybe? Was, was it the worship leader's fault? She didn't pick your favorite song and you didn't get to sing it, so now you're not in the spiritual mood and you're not feeling God? What I want to do today is hopefully show you that the presence of God is so much bigger than just our feelings. The presence of God is greater, grander. It does include, but it exceeds our simple feelings. And I want you to know, if you don't always feel God's presence, you're not alone. Look at Psalm 88, 13 through 14. That'll be our, our key verse to kick things off today. Psalm 88, 13 through 14. If you look at that for a moment, there's Bibles in your chairs. You can look it up on your phone. We take no offense. Digital is fine. You version is a good version. But Psalm 88, 13 through 14, we'll put it up on the screen in a moment. The psalmist, you, 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 can, heal the, you can hear his frustration as he cries out. And he says, But Lord, God, I I cry out to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer goes before you. Why, Lord? Why? Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? God, I I need your help. I want to feel your presence, God. But it's like heaven is silent. It's like there's a ceiling that's blocking my prayers. There's a ceiling that's dividing me from you. I can't hear you. I want your presence, but you're not there. Why are you rejecting me, God? You look at some of the the, the spiritual greats in the Bible. Think of King David, right? David, David had intimate times, many intimate times with God. A man after God's own heart, the Bible tells us. And we know this. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? David says, because you are with me, God. But then elsewhere, David cries out to God and says, God, God, where are you? I can't feel you. Why aren't you you answering my prayers? Why are you allowing my enemies to do this? God, where are you? Cries out David. So David didn't even get to always feel the presence of God. Think about Paul, right? One of the luminaries of the Bible. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament. I mean, this guy, the Apostle Paul, this guy, this guy gets to personally have a personal one-on-one revelationary revelationary experience of Jesus Christ appearing in his life. I mean, that's, holy smokes, that's amazing, right? Right? He gets this glorious experience. And, and, and then, if you know Paul's story, he's not even allowed to talk to anybody about it. Right? If you read your New Testament, he doesn't even get to talk to anybody. He has this amazing Christ encounter. Doesn't get to talk to anybody. He ends up going basically into, a, into the wilderness, so to speak, for a number of years before he even becomes a missionary and gets to go start planting churches. And so here's Paul who gets this amazing revelation from God, but then he's got he's to wait, he's got to wait, he's got to wait. He's out making tents. He's, he's sitting there, I'm sure, thinking, God, give me a chance. God, where are you? I, I'm ready to go. You came to me. I've changed. I'm no longer the man I once was. I am a new creation in Christ. Where are you, God? I'm ready to get in the game. Let's go. But I don't feel you yet. What do I do? And think about Jesus. Jesus who who walked in the most intimate fellowship, moment by moment with God. Jesus is, is on a cross. Jesus becomes sin for us. And now I can't, I can't even fully explain all of this because I, I don't even... I, it's, the Bible isn't completely clear. Scripture's not totally clear on this, what, exactly how God went through this and what He did or didn't do. But evidently, when Jesus was on a cross, He became sin and died for our sins. And God, God the Father is, is so holy that He couldn't look upon us. And whatever happened, uh, the world becomes dark and as Jesus is giving up his life. And, and Jesus in that moment, he, he, he desperately, he, he looks up at the heavens and cries out, Eli, Eli, 
Lema Sabaxani. My God, my God, where are you? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, God's own Son, in His greatest moment of brokenness. God, you've been with me my whole life, Father, but I can't feel you now. Where are you, God? I don't know how many of you have uh, experienced or read some of C.S. Lewis's works. If you don't know, if you're not a reader, or maybe you're not even a Christian, but C.S. Lewis is, is like this, he's, he's like this literary giant within Christianity, right? He's the guy who wrote the Narnia books, Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, they've made some movies, Prince Caspian and some of that. He's that guy. But he wrote other things like Mere Christianity you might have heard of, or the Screw Tape Letters, or a bunch, a bunch of other books. He's very prolific. And uh, so, so he's this, this, this spiritual giant, so to speak, when it comes to Christianity. And uh, this is what he wrote one time in his life when he didn't sense or, or feel the, the presence of God. Here's, here's what he wrote during one of those, those painful times in his life. He, he cried out to God and he said this. He said, he said, I got a door slammed in my face and the sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. And after that, it was silent. Now he said this in a... Uh, you know, in a, in a writing of his. And then he went on to say that this experience caused Lewis to doubt the very presence of God. And then he goes on, he's speaking very metaphorically, but he goes on and he says, there are no lights in the windows. I think the house might be empty. In other words, where are you, God? Was this house even ever inhabited? It seemed like there was once because I saw some light. Why is God why is God why is God so present in our times of prosperity but then often we feel like he's absent in our times of trouble Now if you always feel the presence of God wonderful but I don't think that's the case for any of us and if you don't always feel the presence of God you're not alone And what I want to do today is suggest three possible reasons for why, for why you may not feel the presence of God in your life at some given time. Now, they're not all the reasons, but they're three, I think, important reasons. And why you go, yeah, you know, God, I, I want to believe in you, but I just, I don't feel you. Where are you? There could be more than these three, but these three are the ones we're going to kick off with. And, and, and the very first one, you'll see some of these in your notes. Uh, number one, if you're taking notes, is why don't we always feel God? Well, number one, Maybe because sometimes we over-sensationalize God. You're over-sensationalizing. You're doing exactly what the disciples did that was recorded in John 6.30. The disciples basically tell Jesus, give us some kind of you know, big, bold, clear sign. Give us something that proves a ta-da kind of thing. Right There is God. So they asked Jesus. They said, Jesus, what sign then will you give that we might see it and believe in you? Huh, these guys hung out with Jesus an awful lot. I mean, they're saying, what sign are you going to give that we might believe it's you? And then they start using their historical past as Jews to increase their argument. They go, you know, Jesus, our ancestors, to you know, get to see the presence of God, our ancestors, they got to eat manna in the wilderness. And it was written that God gave them bread from heaven to eat. How are you going to show us that you're here with us? You know, God, you did this. God, you did that. You performed this miracle. You gave them some, this bread from heaven. All these things. You gave them a sense of your presence. Why? What are you going to give us? What are you doing for us so that we all know your presence is here? So sometimes we over-sensationalize it. You know, you want to know more of God. You want to feel it. Maybe you're looking for that, like, audio voice, right? Sounds like Morgan Freeman while you're driving on the road speaking to you in your car. Sally, this is the voice of God. I can't even imitate him. He's got that voice. And you're going, God, what do I do here? Right? You, I, you've probably been there like I have. Lord, do I take this job? God, should I date this boy? Lord, what do I do with my life? How do I deal with this situation, God? Hello? 
Are you there, God? It's me. Are you listening? Can you at least send some angels or something? No? Really? That's what we're doing today. What should I do? Sometimes we over-sensationalize that. Let me tell you this. God doesn't always reveal himself that way. We don't always get to hear this audio voice from God. Now, there are times where we may certainly feel God. But there are going to be times when we don't. And we have to understand that our feelings are not evidence of the presence of God. Feelings are not evidence that God is or isn't with us. Because, see, if you always felt God's presence, you wouldn't even need faith, right? If you always felt the presence of God, if you always felt Him, you always knew He was there, you always had that, for whatever reason, that extrasensory resonation with God that you knew He was there, you wouldn't even have to have faith because you just know He's there. But you see, the Bible is clear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So some people over-sensationalize it. You're simply just looking for kind of those goosebump moments, right? You want to hear that audible voice. When you're sitting there in your 27 hours of meditation and silent prayer, you expect God to speak to you, right? But that's not always the way that God works. But hear this. He is always with you. Even if He doesn't answer, even if He doesn't send the flock of angels... If you don't hear from Him, He is still there and present and always with you. God is always with us. The second thing, if you're taking notes, now I, I don't want to say this, I don't, I'm not using this to scare you, but, but as your pastor, I, I feel a little obligated that I've got to share this one with you. Sometimes some of us aren't feeling the presence of God because maybe our hearts have hardened, Right? Maybe if you're not hearing from God and you were expecting to hear from God today, that's an internal heart issue on your part. Your heart has hardened. You've, you, something has happened. You've, you, you've closed off that passage, a, a message way that God speaks to you. This is Jesus quoting the prophet Isaiah. This comes in Matthew 13, 14 through 15. And Jesus said this. He said, You'll be ever hearing, but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And then he said, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have their eyes closed. They closed their eyes to God. And what happened? They used to have their eyes open. They used to be able to see where God was working. They used to see what God was doing. But over time, their hearts grew hard. And so now spiritually, they have created a barrier that they didn't used to have, that keeps them from hearing from God. So if you're not hearing from God like you used to, there, it becomes a time for some self-examination and reflection. What's happened? Is it me? And I don't say this to scare you, but that, that happens to us, some of us, right? We, we allow our hearts sometimes to grow cold. We, we allow maybe anger or bitterness or, or, or strife or, or, or addiction or something to come into our lives. Because see, hear me on this, the number one cause of a hard heart is sin in our life. And that sin separates us from God. That creates a barrier where we're not able to hear from God like we once maybe did. Let me explain it this way. If you if you sin against God, does that mean He doesn't love you anymore? That you're not a Christian anymore? Thankfully, no. Or we'd all be in deep trouble. You sin against God and you're a follower of Jesus, you're still a follower of Jesus. But what happens is that sin, that sin breaks the intimacy that you once had with God. I mean, imagine, you've got a husband and wife. One of, them, one of them terribly commits adultery. Does that mean immediately they're no longer married? No, they're still married. But are they as intimate as they were before? No. The trust has been broken. And so that, that, that sin, it, it separates us, right? It breaks the fellowship that was once there, that we once had with God. That's what happens. That's one of the reasons why we might not be hearing from God. 
I mean, whenever we live, uh, well, we're going to sin. We live in a broken world filled with sin. We all mess up. I'm sure I'll mess up today. I'm sure I probably already have messed up today. But when we continue to live in that, right? When we don't separate and distance ourselves from that sin, when we're not repenting of it, when we're not confessing it, when we're not trying to, to get over that sin in our life, when we're not saying, God, help me, cleanse me of this, remove this from me, when we're not fighting against that sin, when we're not dealing with it, over time, it's kind of like, you know, you hear these commercials, it's like that plaque that builds up in your arteries in your heart, right? What happens with that plaque? There's always plaque in your body. What's the danger with the plaque? It starts building up. And when it starts to build up, then what happens? It starts to harden. And once it starts to harden, what does that lead to? Heart attacks. Death. <coughs> Suddenly we can't sense that God is there because our hearts are hardened from our sin. If you continue to let sin rule your life, it's not that God's not there, but there's something that's separating you, blocking you, keeping you from feeling that intimate connection with the goodness of God. God is still there. You don't feel Him. Now some might say, yeah, well, you know, pastor, you know, this, I'm, I'm not doing the big sins, right? Just little ones. Well, congratulations, really good for you, right? Way to go for only having little sins and not big ones. But the problem is, in God's eyes, sin is sin. And the problem is with us sometimes, we just learn to live with sin, right? We get comfortable with our sin. We get used to our sin. We, we, we even sometimes forget that we're sinning. And we quit paying attention to it. Or maybe we just sanitize it and just say, Oh, that's just, you know, that, that's how I am. That's, you know, I, I, I grew up this way. I don't have to deal with that. That's just me, right? Our culture says everybody's doing it. It's not that big of a deal, right? And so if you just go on and you go on and you keep living it, you keep living it, you keep just not addressing and dealing with that sin, whatever it might be, it could be envy, it could be anger, it could be addiction, it could be any of many of all of those sins. And if you're not dealing with it, that hardens your heart. And that can become a barrier between you and God. This is what David prayed in the Old Testament after he, he, he sinned. And, and, and David was a man after God's own heart, but we know the story of David. David was also certainly a broken man filled with sin. And so David cries out to God. He says, God, create in me a pure heart. Maybe your heart is hardened. Create in me a pure heart, O Lord. Renew within me a right spirit. Restore me to the joy of my salvation. I'm not trying to make you feel bad today. That's not what I'm out after. But if you've got something that speaking to you right now, an issue, sin, brokenness, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit's working on you right now. Deal with that. Deal with that issue. Deal with it today. If you're not feeling like God is close to you, maybe that is the reason why. You've got something that's hardening your heart, that's blocking you from a deeper intimacy with God. Because the reality is, He is there. God hasn't gone anywhere. He's just waiting for you. So I don't always feel God. Sometimes it's from sensationalizing. Sometimes it's the hardness of heart. But as I said, I had three points. And so the third point is this. Sometimes we don't feel the presence of God because maybe God wants to draw you in a little bit more close. I don't always feel the presence of God, but maybe God wants to draw you in closer. I love in Acts 17, 26, where Paul is, he's there preaching in Athens, and he says, from one man, God made all of the nations that they should inhabit the whole of the earth. You see, Paul says, he then marked out all of their appointed times in history and all of the boundaries of their land. And then Paul said this. He gives us the why behind it. Why did God do this? He said, God did this so that what? God did this so that we would seek Him. What did God do? God did this. God, God created 
God showed His glory of who He was. He did this so that people would reach out to Him. People would say, I want God. I want to know Him. I want to pursue Him. There may be those times, and and this is just me suggesting it, that you may not feel God like you're close. And it may be because God is trying to get you to pursue Him. God wants to bring you to a place where you have more desire to know more of Him. If God doesn't feel close to you, then you need to do something about that. You need to spend some more time in the Word, some more time in prayer, maybe more time with the people of God, something that's going to help you draw near to Him. Deprivation draws out desire. If I don't eat, what do I get? Well, skinny. But if I don't eat, I get hungry, right? If I don't drink, I get thirsty. If I don't sense the presence of God, I just might start hungering and thirsting for more of God. You see, familiarity breeds content. But you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? You've heard that. What if God in His glory is trying to draw you into seeking Him out? Where to this place that you get where you're starting to want more and more of Him. Maybe right now you're feeling, or maybe in the past or maybe in the future, like God isn't close. Maybe God is using that moment. Maybe He's saying, John, I'm not feeling close to you today because I want you to seek me. Seek me out. Come looking for me, because I am there. Maybe you're saying, I want more of you, God. I thirst. Well, if you're thirsty, you get a drink. If you're wanting more of God, seek that out. You see, our our God, you need to know this, our God is a jealous God. I want you to understand this. He, He wants to be number one in your life. He wants to be the greatest object of your desire. It's not about being the best at Fortnite. God doesn't care about that. It's not about having the best boat, the biggest house, the fastest car, the best grades. It's not about having the biggest bank account. Any of those things are perfectly fine, worldly speaking. But God doesn't want any of those to rival Him in your life. He wants you to pursue Him. He wants you to be a person after His heart. So let me say this again, just because God feels silent doesn't mean that He's absent. We were created to pursue Him. And the good news is, according to Jeremiah 20, verse 9, God says, if you seek me, God says, if you seek me, you will find me. God says, when you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found by you. When you seek Him, you will find Him. So perhaps for some of you, God is just trying to create this longing in your heart by you're not feeling that He's close at the moment. And so when you wake up in the morning and say, God, I want to experience you today. God, I want to know you are there with me. Press into Him. Seek first His kingdom. Seek first His righteousness. And then as you do that, God says, all of these things will be added unto you. That you will have this newfound intimacy and closeness with Him. Maybe God is trying to draw you in. And any time that you you sense this this powerful, maybe even in a supernatural way, you sense this presence of God, embrace it. Live in those moments. Enjoy it. It is okay. You you can, I can tell you all kinds of stories where I, I certainly have felt the presence of God. And in those moments, have moments like Moses where where he goes, Moses goes, I am standing on holy ground. And he takes off his shoes and gets down and bows down and worships at the burning bush, if you remember the story. He knows, Moses knows he's in the presence of God. And so if if you're having one of those, if you're in one of those, and, and you experience that, lean into it. Get down on your face and say, God, I know you are here with me. God desires for us to be in intimate relationship with Him. When you experience that, give Him the worship, give Him the glory. 
Let it happen. You let the tears flow if that's it. Embrace it. Because God is real and He is with you. Never forget that He is always with you. And don't forget to embrace Him in those moments. It can be those moments, maybe you're driving to work early in the morning. I get this late at night when I leave church. I start driving down this road. I get a panoramic view of God's splendor and glory and the sunsets over glory. Right? For me, visual is a big thing. I sense God's presence walking through the woods. I sense God's presence in solitude on a mountain. I sense God's presence on the back deck of my yard, sitting there, just enjoying the land. Find those moments. Cultivate those opportunities where you can grow and feel closer to God. Maybe when you pray for somebody, Maybe that can bring you into the presence of God. Maybe you're serving somebody, loving, giving, doing something to reach out. Maybe, maybe you're telling somebody about Jesus. If you're feeling God present in that moment, lean into it and go with it. And then thank God for it. You see, God is always with us. But don't just trust your feelings. Know it. Because He promises you. Whether or not you feel it, God is always there. The fact is, God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. When you seek Him, you will find Him. Because He loves you and He loves to reveal Himself to those who pursue Him. Seek God and He will respond. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.